I'd be happy to share some of what we and others have learned about this. Um, it's important to recognize the data are still at an early stage in their maturity, um, but one of the best and most, I think, reliable reports we have comes from one of the earliest adopters of this approach, and that's the University of Michigan Health System, where Rick Boothman and others picked up this approach and really ran with it. Um, these data are especially valuable because they were peer-reviewed and published in the very reputable medical journal, the Annals of Internal Medicine. And as a scholar of, of legal reform, I must say that the results are really nothing short of astonishing. What this institution was able to achieve in terms of bottom line financial results, as you see here, is really just staggering. When they looked at the period after they implemented this program compared to the period before, they saw their rate of new claims go down dramatically from seven to about four and a half for every 100,000 patient encounters. The median time between getting a claim reported to the institution and resolving that claim also decreased significantly. And it's remarkable because this institution was already resolving things very quickly. The median time nationally is about three years. They got that down under a year. And patient compensation costs um, decreased dramatically, especially in the cases that actually became lawsuits. So even when this program wasn't successful in halting a, an incident from becoming a lawsuit, they were never let the less successful in building enough of a relationship with patients to reduce settlement costs. And part of this, again, is trimming the time to resolution. The longer a case drags on, as everyone knows, the more expenses get puffed up into that ask. Um, finally, they were able to reduce their legal expenses significantly. Significantly, and this was really the impetus for them adopting the program in the first place. Um, the lawyers asked, why are we spending so much time and money defending cases that aren't defensible? Um, so after this paper came out, I think institutions nationally were very justifiably asking the question, how do we get on, on this, this deal, and, and is it replicable? Um, and that's a little harder to assess at this stage. The data are a little bit less clear. But here's what we have heard so far from other early adopters and later adopters of the program. We have two reports, um, one for here at Stanford from Summit and the other from University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, both of these programs um, resemble the Michigan model in key respects. Um, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, what they, their internal report um, is that they were able to dramatically increase the rate of adverse event reporting. Now, most most likely that's not because the hospital became less safe, but because they were able to foster a culture of timely reporting to risk management. Um, they did see their rate of new claims drop dramatically, about 50 percent over the same period. And the median time to resolving those incidents, also dramatic reduction from 55 months, nearly five years, down to one year. Uh, so these, again, when you think about what we have been able to achieve with public policy reforms like damages caps, these results are just orders of magnitude more impressive. Um, and the, the most recent data here from Stanford, um, which was compiled by their independent actuary and, again, looked at a pre-post type of comparison within the same institution, also found dramatic reductions in the frequency of lawsuits, about a 50 percent reduction, about a 40 percent reduction in what was paid among the cases where some payment was made, and a 20 percent reduction uh, in defense costs for cases that were handled through the CRP as compared to the traditional approach. So can other institutions get these results? That's the big question. And the federal government has made a significant investment recently in trying to find out. Um, they funded a variety of three-year demonstration projects testing this approach in other settings non-academic medical centers, places where the physician and the hospital might have separate liability mm -hmm. insurance, commercial liability insurance instead of a captive, where the physicians aren't employed by the hospital and might be harder to control, or where multiple insurers might have to cooperate to resolve a claim. Finally, it's been tested in areas that don't have strong tort reforms and where physicians really live in much greater fear of liability. And um, the results of these projects, I would say, are mixed in terms of what has been achieved. Um, the areas of success, I think, primarily lie in the realm of communication, that when we have tried, for example, to roll this out in five hospitals in New York City and in six uh, hospitals and multi-specialty physician clinics in Washington state, there were uh, significant successes in increasing internal reporting of adverse events, improving disclosure practices. For the first time, many of these institutions developed a mechanism to ascertain whether disclosure was actually carried out and that it was a meaningful conversation. 
Um, in many of the hospitals, stronger relationships developed between the clinical staff and risk management, um, which improved the risk management office's ability to intervene early and effectively when adverse events occurred. And in Washington, where we tried to get multiple insurers to cooperate, some of the partners were quite successful in improving their relationships, others less so. Um, and finally, there, these projects got the institutions to greatly expand their radar screen in terms of the kinds of events that they were actively tracking, whereas before a risk manager in these settings might typically just triage out the most significant harm events and or the cases where a family was angry and complaining. Um, this program led them to put all reported events, at least initially, on their radar screen for some type of cursory investigation and follow-up, and then triage and decision-making about what additional steps were, were to be taken. And I think one exciting development in a lot of these hospitals is, for the first time, the risk mm -hmm. and quality or patient safety offices began having conversations, would develop um, Monday morning meetings where they went through cases together to decide what next steps had to be taken and to ensure that those steps had been taken and that appropriate communications were made with families. So for many institutions, although these sound like simple things, they were very big innovations that I think substantially improved the environment of transparency and follow-up with patients. I think where some of the pro projects were less successful is on the compensation end. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what we were able to do um, very well is uh, enable institutions to more effectively screen and identify candidates for early settlement. Um, the types of cases that had kind of always been in mind for them as the cases they should be settling, but for one reason or another, they hadn't been very effective in doing that. What was harder um, was ensuring that every time it was determined that there was a standard of care violation, there was a, some type of compensation offer made. And there were various reasons why this didn't always occur. One big reason is that sometimes the insurer didn't share the hospital's view of the case um, or would be considering other factors in deciding whether to make a settlement offer. And in many other cases, they were so effective with the communication that they felt there wasn't a need to follow up with compensation because the patient seemed happy, seemed mm -hmm. satisfied with the apology, and uh, there was just little appetite for proactively offering to compensate before the patient had asked. But we did see a significant increase in the openness um, in terms of risk managers creating space in the conversation for patients to make that ask. So whereas typically they might give an explanation and then be silent, um, at least in in most programs, they would ask, is there anything more I can do for you? Is there anything more that you're looking for? What, what, what do we need to do to help you have resolution around this event? Um, there were other challenges that were encountered in implementation. One is just a reluctance on the part of some institutions to jump in once they had set up this program to find that first case and, and get started. And as a result, in some of the projects, we didn't see many cases go through this approach. Um, and some of the institutions struggled more than others to win over physicians. You know, there are a lot of fears that if you offer a patient a modest amount of money, they're going to run out and sue and, and seek a, a great deal more uh, money, or that um, participation in disclosure will eventually lead to more reports to the National Practitioner Data Bank, and institutions had to work hard to dispel those kinds of fears. Um, and then uniformly, we found across institutions that tried this, a um, great surprise about how much work is actually involved. This, this, this sounds like such a simple idea. It sounds like what they do all the time. But there's a big difference between doing this in the cases you know you're going to pay on anyway and doing it every time you, you know that there has been a standard of care deviation. And then finally, it's particularly complex to do this in situations where a hospital and an external insurance company have to collaborate to resolve a claim. For example, where you have a community obstetrician practicing at a hospital hospital and they have separate insurance. Um, getting one organization to fully buy into this philosophy is hard. Getting two to fully buy in and then really work collaborati and tr collaboratively and trust one another really takes a very deep commitment and a willingness to take a leap of faith. So that's what we've learned. I think there are, there's a great deal more we need to learn. Um, I view these data as um, you know, less happy than we would have liked, but still promising. To me, they demonstrate that institutions that have a deep commitment to adequately resourcing this program and working together uh, and following a principled approach will a principled approach will succeed. Institutions that have a less deep commitment or less ability to resource the program will not. So playing off of that, Tom, given the data, which seems basically positive and gradations of positivity. Um, why isn't there greater adoption? I think until recently, there's been a relative paucity of best practices. Mm -hmm. 
and especially best practices that can be adapted to a variety of care delivery settings. So best practices that work not only in a large academic health center, but in a multi-specialty physician group or a long-term care setting. Um, those best practices are starting to emerge but that's been one important barrier. And then the support to understand how do you take those best practices and actually implement them successfully. Yeah, and Michelle, you alluded that there's more research that needs to be done. What's the number one unanswered question currently? You know, to me it is, uh, what is the experience like for patients? You know, we hear a lot about success stories uh, where the institution has really succeeded in building a trusting relationship with patients and resolving it. But how representative are these studies? I've often been surprised at the reluctance of many institutions to open them up yeah. themselves up to a survey or some other means of systematically assessing the patient's experience. We've just started doing that for the first time at the University of Michigan and at, now at hospitals in Massachusetts. So I'm very excited to, to learn um, what this program feels like uh, to most or all the patients going through it.